Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you, yes you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. Today we're kicking off our first series ever, our AI series, where we're going to go through AI, how to make it move, what nav meshes are, all kinds of stuff. And in this one, we're doing the introduction to nav meshes. What is a nav mesh? The nav mesh is a data structure that Unity has that allows agents, AI, to understand the world around them and how to get from position A to position B. There are four key parts of a nav mesh. There's the actual nav mesh, which is again the data structure. There's the nav mesh agent, which is the AI that walks around on that nav mesh. There are nav mesh obstacles, which prevent agents from going through something. And those can be described as nav mesh obstacles or they can be nav mesh modifiers attached to different game objects to prevent an area from being walkable, jumpable, whatever it is it needs to be. The fourth part is the what used to be called off mesh link and now is nav mesh link. I might use those two interchangeably just because I learned AI navigation first when it was called off mesh link. Nav meshes are a little bit confusing in Unity because there's some of it that's built into Unity and some of it that you wouldn't actually know about it unless you really start looking for it. And that's called the nav mesh components. Those are available on GitHub and you can install those into your project by using the package manager. You can modify the manifest JSON file by adding this, which you see on screen right now, to your manifest file. That tells Unity to install this from GitHub and use it as a package. These nav mesh components give us powerful new tools like the nav mesh surface, which allows us to define and bake nav meshes per agent with a bunch of other settings. So we actually do not use the baking that's built into the Unity editor. And that's kind of a weird thing with how nav meshes are now. As part of the navigation components, we also get things like the nav mesh modifier and nav mesh modifier volume, and of course the nav mesh link, which replaces the off mesh link. What we're going to do in this first video is add two nav mesh agents, one for the player and one for an enemy. We'll make it when you click anywhere on a nav mesh, the player will move there and we will have the enemy always follow the player. So what that means is we're going to have two different nav mesh agents defined. We'll have two nav mesh surfaces defined and we, the scene already comes with some, I set up some 12 by 12 pro builder grid with some obstacles around. So we'll use the nav mesh modifier to prevent the agents from walking through walls and from being able to get on top or from thinking that they can get on top of some of those obstacles. Let's hop in. In my demo scene, I have a 12 by 12 pro builder cube and I've put other pro builder cubes on top to act as obstacles or walls. I put all of these under a game object called world geometry. So when we're baking the nav mesh, we can collect from children instead of the entire scene. That makes it a lot easier to manage what is and is not going to be a part of our nav mesh. The first thing we'll do is add a nav mesh surface to the world geometry game object. This gives us a few options. The agent type, collect objects, include layers, use geometry, and some advanced options that we won't get into in this video. As I was saying in the intro, we can bake a nav mesh per agent type. Right now we only have one agent type, the default humanoid one. For collect objects, we'll choose children, so we don't bake the player and the enemy as part of the nav mesh. Include layers, we'll use everything right now, but for your project, you'll probably want to choose specific layers that will be maybe a layer called world geometry or nav mesh, something like that, because most likely you'll want to do some kind of ray casting and it makes it a lot easier to find walls. For use geometry, since we have very simple meshes, it doesn't matter if we use render meshes or physics colliders but generally the physics colliders ones are a lot better for this. If we click bake, we notice that the nav mesh doesn't connect everywhere. This is a result of our nav mesh agent having a too large of a radius for this particular scene. If you don't already have the navigation window, you can go to window, AI, navigation to open it up and we'll click on the agent tab. We see that the 0.5 radius is here and that's too large because most of the time in this scene, objects are one meter apart and that doesn't leave the agent enough room to get around. So we'll change it to 0.25. If we bake the nav mesh again, now the agent can get around just about everywhere very easily. 
but we also see that the nav mesh thinks that it can walk on top of these walls, and that's not really what we want. So what I'll do is select all of the walls and add a nav mesh modifier. As I was saying earlier, the nav mesh modifier allows you to prevent an agent from thinking that it can use this object as a walkable surface. If we say ignore from build, we'll notice that all of these walls are now excluded from the build and the nav mesh agent thinks that it can walk through all of these walls. It's obviously not what we want, but that is a feature supported in the nav mesh modifier. So what we'll do is say override area and say that it is a not walkable surface. These areas are defined in the areas tab of the navigation window. If we rebake the world geometry, the agent no longer thinks that it can get on top of these walls. Let's head back to the navigation window and we'll add a second one by clicking this plus button right beneath the agent types and we'll rename this one to enemy one. So that way we have two different nav meshes for each of our different agent types. Select humanoid agent type. Let's rename this to be player. We'll lower that enemy's radius to 0.33 just so we have a different nav mesh. It's not the exact same. And if we add a new nav mesh surface to the world geometry, set it up exactly the same as the previous one, except change the agent type to enemy one and bake that, we'll see a very similar nav mesh, but with a little bit less space to get around shows up. Let's start creating the scripts. We'll make both of them, but we'll start with player movement. So we'll create one script called player movement and one called enemy movement. I'll add the required component type of nav mesh agent, which comes from unityengine.ai. And on awake, we'll assign a reference to a nav mesh agent that we call agent by doing agent equals git component agent. This just prevents us from having to assign it in an inspector. And we'll also add a reference to the camera by doing private camera camera, and we'll serialize that field so we can see it in the inspector. In the update function, we'll listen for when the user left clicks by doing input.getkeyup keycode.mouse0. And in that, what we want to do is find where the user's mouse is and draw an array from there to try to hit a nav mesh and then tell our agent to walk there. We do this by array, passing in the input.mouse position. That gives us the ray that's coming from the mouse position directly down. We use the physics.raycast non alloc to prevent any garbage from being generated. And the second argument there we need is a raycast hit array. So I define this at the class level to do private raycast hit. Hits equals new raycast hit. And we'll just put one here. It doesn't actually matter how many hits we get because we're going to take the first one all the time. So if we hit at least one thing, we will say agent.set destination to wherever we hit, which is hits zero dot point. If we hop back to the Unity editor and attach the player movement to the player object, we'll assign the camera reference to the player movement. And if we click play, we can see our player will move wherever we click, automatically avoiding the walls. Next, let's set up the enemy movement. We'll open the enemy movement class, add public transform target. This will be the target that we're gonna have this enemy follow. And what we're gonna do is have it on a coroutine set the destination of the agent. So we'll put a public float update speed, which will be how frequently to recalculate the path based on the target transform. On start, we'll start a coroutine to move that agent and we'll call that follow target. We'll make a wait for seconds, call it wait, and make it be a new wait for seconds with the update speed. We'll say while this is enabled, but we need a reference to the agent. So we'll do the same thing we just did on player movement, require component type of nav mesh agent. We'll call it agent, and on awake we'll assign that the same way with agent equals git component nav mesh agent. Then in the while loop of the coroutine, we'll say agent.set destination target.position, and we'll yield return the wait. If we hop back to the Unity editor, assign the enemy movement script to the enemy, attach the player to the target, and click play, we'll see that the enemy starts following the player immediately. 
If we click to move the player, the enemy auto repaths to wherever the player's position is. We see that the enemy does have a lot of trouble getting around because he's a little bit fatter than the player. To make the enemy move around faster, what we can do is adjust the radius to be the same, 0.25, and we can rebake. And he'll be getting around a lot easier then. Let's take a look at the NavMesh agent component. There's the agent type, which we've already discussed, is the agent type defined in the navigation window. The base offset is the offset of the collision for the cylinder in relation to the transform pivot point, which in this particular case, if we look at our capsule collider, the center is 0, 0, 0, but the height is 2, which gives us the base offset of 1. When we use a 3D model, the base may be at the bottom, in which case we would set a base offset of 0. You'll have to play with this setting to see how it works with your particular models and configurations. Speed is how fast the agent will move at the top speed. This is in world units per second. Angular speed is a maximum speed of rotation, degrees per second. This controls how fast an agent will turn towards the direction that they're trying to go. In our case, right now with just cylinders, we can't really tell any change on this. We can set as high or low as we want and we don't really notice anything. Once we add in a model, it's a lot more obvious and you'll need to play with the setting to see what looks best with your model and your animation configuration. Acceleration is the maximum acceleration that the agent can move, and that's in world units per second squared, so how fast they will reach the top speed. Stopping distance is how close the agent needs to be to the end position before it will stop. This is really useful to prevent nav mesh agents from walking inside of their target. Auto braking is whether or not you want the agent to slow down before reaching the destination. Under optical avoidance, we have radius and height. These two should match what you've defined in the agent types in the navigation window. We also have avoidance quality, and the higher quality you have, the more CPU intensive it is, and also the better avoidance it is. And this is predictive avoidance. This means that the nav mesh agents will not actively try to avoid obstacles or other agents. That's very useful to set to none if you want maybe a zombie horde that's going to run through one another, but not very good if you want non-overlapping models. That goes hand in hand with priority. Lower priority agents, meaning closer to zero, will push other nav mesh agents out of the way. Just remember that lower numbers are higher priority. Under pathfinding, we have auto traverse off mesh link, auto repath, and area mask. The first two I think are pretty self-explanatory if it should automatically traverse an off mesh length, if it should automatically repath, and under area mask, we can define which nav mesh area types this nav mesh agent can traverse. I hope you got a lot of value out of this video, and I hope you're going to get a lot of value out of this series. AI is a complex topic, and we're gonna go through a bunch of stuff. This was just scratching the surface, adding in basic movement and basic following a player. There's a bunch more we're gonna get into in the next videos, and I can't wait for you to check them out. If you enjoyed this video, if you have any suggestions for future topics, or if you have implemented AI in your game as a result of watching this video, drop a comment down below and I'll see you on the next video.